so the title of my talk is California's Role in Making Regenerative Medicine a Reality. But first, I'd like to start with Oscar um, in honor of his lectureship. So you've all heard the quote, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants and Oscar truly was a giant. So here's some lessons I learned by training at Stanford, training under Oscar, ask questions frequently and strive for solutions. So as many of you know, early in his career, Oscar um, looked at the role of donor specific transfusions and being able to modulate the immune system. This led to tolerance research he brought me into the fold and introduced me to Sam Strober. Transplant team that Dr. Boost is carrying on the work in transplant tolerance, which is spectacular. Um, he always strove to solve problems with complex unmet medical needs and um, realized that they required tailored approaches as we call it personalized medicine, precision medicine, um, and made tremendous progress in being able to um, transform the field of pediatric kidney transplantation by figuring out how to transplant adult-sized kidneys in children, taking into account technology, immunosuppression, and technical aspects. And as Carlos said, the steroid-free protocol. He valued collaboration. He'd often say life is about people. He said that often. And it seems so simple, but it's so true. The older I get, the more I realize how important that is. And this is a quote from, of course, Oscar was, would be the one to invite Pope John Paul II to talk about transplant. And this is a quote I was, and many of you in the audience were there at the Vatican when um, Pope John Paul spoke about how organ donation was an act of human kindness. That was really, <laughs> it was one of the most powerful things to hear uh, there on the Piazza uh, Congressi. Um, and then policy and infrastructure, Carlos mentioned the uh, landmark National Organ Transplant Act of 1984. That made this all possible. Organ sharing, the equitable and um, accessible distribution of organs that makes the whole field possible and so much more surrounding that. And then of course, Oscar is known as a mentor and he was pleased with knowledge and awarded for his advisory and mentorship. And when he, um, retired from clinical transplant, he remained a mentor as the uh, associate dean for medical students. So I tell you this because you'll see a lot of these themes throughout the programs I've had the great fortune to lead in the recent years. But let me give a little bit of a, a story because Carlos said, please tell your story. Um, and so people often ask, how did you go from being a transplant surgeon to leading a regenerative medicine stem cell company or organization. And let's go back to what the definition is of regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is a replacement or regeneration of human cells, tissue or organs to restore or establish normal function. To you surgeons out there, does that sound familiar? Surgery to me, transplantation, are regenerative medicine. They actually are precursors to the, what we call today as cell and gene regenerative medicine. So if we kind of look, this is kind of a obviously not to scale timeline, um, but from the onset of modern surgery in the 1700s, 1700s where John Hunter demonstrated you can methodically um, create a situation for wound healing and repair, all the other types of techniques he introduced. Um, the field of surgery progressed and 1954, the field of organ transplantation was born with the first organ transplant from the sixties to the eighties. And many of you were part of this history was that liver transplant, heart transplant, pancreas, intestinal improvements in bone marrow transplant and lung transplants were made possible. This was the new field. So let me say, and I'm gonna disclose when I was born, I was born around the time that transplantation was developing as a field. So actually transplant was part of my formative years from the very early days when I was an undergrad at Duke. My very first research experience was with Dr. Bernard Amos, who is one of the early, he's a physician scientist and one of the early um, researchers looking at the immune system and the major histocompatibility complex. That was my first lab job and then I caught the bug. 
Um, went on to medical school and surgical training while I, while I was in Boston. Um, Tony Monaco was very influence, influential in my development, introduced me to Fritz Bach. And that's when I went into more kind of molecular cell biology and transplant immunology. I was then fortunate to land a fellowship here at Stanford and have an amazing career as a transplant. And um, I had the opportunity to be a pediatric transplant. One of the most gratifying um, experiences, it's hard to describe, and I don't need to describe that to you because I'll share in that experience of being surgeon. One of the things that always, so I'm looking at this timeline, one of the things that always kind of um, stuck in my mind was that when we would transplant foreign errors in metabolism and genetic diseases, that we would remove these very healthy looking beautiful little livers, subject the moms who have to take care of these babies. This is amazing, by the way, miraculous, life-saving, transformative transplant. And the babies would be in-house for, you know, we would have to wash out and it would be weeks and sometimes longer. And I just thought this is remarkable, but this is just a start. So I was always looking for the next thing because it's been, Carlos knew because at, at transplant, um, Transplant meetings, I was always the one questioning, okay, is this the right thing? Um, cell transplant or liver um, or hepatocyte transplant with Ira Fox and um, Steve Strom had some early experiences of possible, uh, you know, uh, efficacy. However, the problem was having re reliable cells. That's just, the, yeah, it was it. And then, there was a convergence of events. 1998 was the isolation of the human embryonic stem cell. It was discovered that you could isolate these stem cells, put them in a dish, and they would have the remarkable capacity to self-renew and to differentiate into any cell and tissue of our body that captured our imagination. Around the same time, the Human Genome Project was launched. And in 2003, the first human genome was California. You can code and you have the material, you can have a solution, right? So being at Stanford, I think really does uh, tee you up to kind of think beyond where we are today. And so with that, I was really intrigued by the world of regenerative medicine. And that's when I went into industry to kind of learn more about it. And what I learned is there was still a lot to be done. You could have these discoveries, you could have prom at the, you know, I, when I went to Stem Cells Inc, it was initially to drive the development of a candidate liver stem cell that looked great in vitro, it looked good in animal cells. Take it and to create a therapeutic out of it was another story. And um, so I kept staying out there because I love a challenge. <laughs> and then six years later, we realized it wasn't gonna happen yet. And that's when I went to CIRM and I realized, you know what, as a field, we need to make significant progress in many arenas for us to truly realize the potential of cell and gene um, uh, regenerative medicine. So in 2012, I joined CIRM. Um, since that, you know, around that time, there's been, <clears throat> has anybody else? I'm brave, I guess. Um, <laughs> Um, discoveries, including <clears throat> one by Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, um, for which he received the Nobel Prize, demonstrating that not we don't actually possibly even need embryos to get these pluripotent cells that can differentiate and proliferate. Actually, take skin cells and blood cells, and taking transcription factors, four factors, which have described you could reprogram these cells to become embryonic-like. So that again, it was like another, you know, advancement that we're already starting to see uh, some progress with. Another development is that all the dark ages of gene therapy. Um, well, gene therapy had a rebirth. Aldna down the street at Berkeley, Al Chapantier, as well as um, George Church and others had 
discovered that you could take CRISPR Cas9, natural way that bacteria protect themselves against, and use it as a cut paste gene editing tool. So introducing the, the fact that we could actually more precise. All of these technologies going forward, while at CIRM, we, we have witnessed the approval of all gene therapies, first and for cancer with CAR T therapy. <laughs> that can <laughs> seek and destroy specifically cancer cells. And also gene therapy for inherited blindness, actually now a marketed product um, by Roche. And then 2019, FDA approved gene therapy, muscular atrophy, which is like an a form of ALS or the Vatican. The first time I saw a film that was presented of a baby who was essentially paralyzed, started walking. I said, this cannot possibly. First of all, I'm at the Vatican. Secondly, we're talking about stem cells. And thirdly, you're seeing some a paralyzed child walking, right? So it was one of those moments I said, this is a this can't be. Then just months later, Novartis had um, announced that they had acquired this technology. And then shortly after that, it was approved. And now it's in um, it's in therapy. So we are in a growth phase for this new form of I'll go into the body of the talk, which is to talk about sir, which I really do hope uh, after this talk you'll learn you'll know more about it and you, that you'll have the opportunity. I'm actually in the midst of even expanding this mission statement, but in fact, oh, oh, okay. I'll have to start all over again. <laughs> all right. So in 2004, CERM was formed with a three billion dollar bond initiative passed by the by the um, citizens of California, and as Carlos had mentioned. We were refunded in 2020 under the most extreme circumstances of the pandemic and economic uncertainty and everything associated with last year and people not being able to come to actually vote, right, to in-person ballots. So it, it, another miracle in terms of a show of support for, for funding and, and um, uh, continuing this work. So to date, CIRM's funded over a thousand programs and advanced stem cell and therapy development across a broad range of indications. We funded over 76 mostly first in human clinical trials and contributed to the development of 90, some of them already marketed in cancer, small molecules that derive from discoveries that, um, that, that were based on stem cell principles. We fund um, programs from first in human to pivotal phase three clinical trials from common diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, to rare diseases, and I'll describe some of that. And the rare disease include Brandon, who's here, who was over five years out from being treated for X-linked chronic granulomatous disease, which is a genetic defect in NADPH oxidase, and then um, the, uh, the inability to mount a, reactor, a reactive oxygen um, radical reaction to fight off bacteria and fungi. So ben, Brendan was in and out of the hospital with multiple uh, you know, uh, chronic abscesses and he is now cured. He's over five years out, just one of the patients in one of these trials. Um, so Brendan, as well as some other cases who I'll present shortly have demonstrated a proof concept that cell and gene therapy um, is a viable therapeutic option. So another thing, and, and somebody else yesterday had asked, um, okay, so CIRM is funding translational clinical research. What about basic science? CIRM 100% um, 
needs to fund basic science. That's all, where it all starts. Almost a billion dollars of the initial $3 billion was funding basic science. The strategy moving forward has a strong commitment to fund basic translational clinical science as well as other programs that I'll describe later. The basic science we funded to date has generated over 3,000 peer-reviewed publications, um, funded 12 stem cell research facilities, including here at Stanford, and 17 shared research laboratories so that those um, investigators um, and labs that didn't have um, access or expertise in stem cell biology or culturing or techniques had access to this. Um, and we built the largest induced pluripotent stem cell research bank. I described the IPSC, which is taking skin, reprogramming and making stem cells. Well, we funded a program that uh, generated a bank of um, induced pluripotent stem cell from a variety, including liver disease actually, of different indications derived all the same way, the reprogrammed all the same way through Cellular Dynamics um, um, International, which is Jamie Thompson's technique to, to derive these stem cells. And it's available widely to industry, to academia. So that is a starting point for a, for a resource tool that has led to discoveries for drug development, fundamental research, as well as potentially precursors to therapeutics. And we spurred the invention of research and translational tools, created novel genomic data sets and bioinformatics tools for stem cell researchers. Stanford was one of the recipients of the Geno Centers for uh, Genomics um, with Mike Snyder and, and group. Already in its 10-year uh, history, CIRM has had sustainable impact in addition to uh, resulting in 90, over 90 candidate um, therapeutics progressing to clinical development, established a clinical network, first in kind, um, stem cell regenerative medicine focused clinical network around California um, that has already um, supported over 100 stem cell clinical trials. It stimulated the California economy study done by USC looking at the period between 2004 and 2018, estimated about an $11 billion gross output from not even products, but just by funding research, funding um, these activities, and, and 56,000 new jobs have been created. It's attracted $18 billion of industry funding now. Five years ago, when we launched a strategic plan, one of our goals was to gain industry pull because CIRM was created to de-risk programs, to take the risk because the science looks great, but most traditional funders aren't ready to come in. It's too risky. There, were, there was actually very little investment into the space. People had been dinged before with a previous wave of tissue engineering. They weren't ready to come in. When we, six years ago, um, we maybe had about $100 million of industry investment into our program. Last, this year, it's over $18 billion. Most have been coming in over the past three to four years. Um, that's by way of licensing, acquisition, follow-on funding, and companies um, going IPO. So, these 76 clinical trials, as I mentioned, span a broad range of indications. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see they're inherited metabolic disorders, blinding eye disease, um, neurodegenerative disease, Huntington's, ALS, Parkinson's, um, and um, blood disorders, malignancies, stroke, heart disease, and even COVID-19. Um, now, I'm gonna go back to one of the topics that I started with, which is transplant. While at Stanford, I had the um, great honor of being involved with the team and some of the first early tolerance induction protocols <clears throat> using non myelablative conditioning um, to allow the acceptance by the recipient of a, of a acceptance of the donor stem cells from the same donors that transplant. The idea is to induce a state of what you call mixed chimerism. Um, mixed chimerism is when you have a coexistence of both the, the recipient's own um, blood cells as well as the donors. And because they're both in coexistence, 
they learn how to create a homeostasis and tolerate each, tolerate each other through a process of clonal deletion, as well as um, induction of different types of cells. So this program was an academic program and it's Stanford spun out the company, Sam Strober et al. Um, and now this program is uh, being carried out in industry by Meteor Therapeutics. Meteor came in for some funding and was funded for the phase three randomized multicenter clinical trial. This is still in progress, but this will be something we watch closely in terms of how you take an academic protocol and figure out how to make this a commercializable um, program that could be distributed um, to patients. So far, um, the, the trial is still ongoing. There have been some initial successes with publicly reported patients who are completely off immunosuppression for two years and 15 additional weaning. I just wanted to point out, in order for this to happen, it has to go under FDA, uh, the FDA pathway. But the amazing thing is over the recent years, the FDA has been able to um, deploy different special paths for stem cell regenerative medicine, including regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation that was created by the 21st century Cures Act, one of the former President Obama had signed before he left office. So through this process, we we're able to partner with the FDA in this new field. Excellent. I wanted to point out, um, again, pediatrics was my love in terms of and, and metabolism, and we should be able to more precisely treat it rather than not gross in terms of gross in terms of large um, approach. But so here's an here's an example, very strong proof of concept. ADA skid is adenosine deaminase um, deficient um, state that results in severe combined immunodeficiency. So it's a bubble baby disease. This little girl Evie was treated as an over seven years out with a full immune system of ADA skid, she underwent a protocol that was developed, co-developed by Don Cohen at UCLA and, um, and London for taking blood stem cells, harvesting these as you would for a normal you know, peripheral blood or bone marrow transplant, genetically engineering them to correct the ADA defect, reintroduce blood stem cells, and as you know, stem cells, when in the right niche, will, will essentially uh, repopulate the, the. And so she demonstrated immediately that she reconstituted. I wanted to just point out with regenerative medicine, cell therapy, no one, it works. You don't guess. It's not, a, oh, maybe there's a correlation between a therapy. You can measure the enzyme that it's there. You can measure this, the immune cells that weren't there functioning. And so um, Evie as well as 50 other babies have been treated with cures at two years and 90% of patients and 100% at three years in the UK. This is now in pivotal phase, initially partnered with Orchard now being carried on by UCLA, more on that. And it's demonstrated remarkable outcome and proof of concept. CIRM is also funding trials with X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency, um, UCSF and St. Jude Hospital, Artemis skid, as well as other forms of genetic diseases, including um, LAD1 here at Stanford and cystinosis at UCSD. And those are progressing. Success in these indications really mark the beginning of a class of a class of uh, a, a new pillar for treating patients with in, inherited um, um, metabolic and gene defects and potentially cures for currently 6,000 incurable conditions. I brought this, bring, keep bringing back to surgery because I, I just wanted to point out how special surgery is as, as, a, as a special, huh? how unique surgery is as a specialty to bring this field forward. So Tiffany McKenzie, who's at UCSF, 
um, was funded by CIRM first as an early investigator and now is the PI on the first ever phase one clinical trial for in utero transplant to treat alpha thalassemia, which is a fatal condition that generally results in high drops, fetal high drops and stillbirth. Her approach is to, um, to use a transplant maternal blood stem cells and transplant them in utero in, the, in a, a welcoming environment because it's, it's a tolerogenic, tolerogenic state of the fetus um, to allow a better acceptance of the maternal blood stem cells, create a state of tolerance. And even if the baby later on needs, requires an additional transplant post birth, they're tolerized to the maternal blood stem cells. So, so far, five patients have been enrolled. Uh, Iliad, baby Ileana, that was featured in the New York Times here with the parents and Dr. McKenzie, was the first of these babies to be enrolled. There is preliminary evidence of chimerism and tolerance, and that trial is ongoing. Another surgeon, I keep choosing female surgeon, accident, Dr. Hahn. <laughs> But Dr. Diane Farmer at um, UC Davis, another remarkable story. Dr. Farmer was, is a pediatric um, in, utero in utero surgeon as well. Self has a remarkable story of how she's here, but she's a very mission driven individual. She was at UCSF and is now at Davis. I mean, at, at Davis. We funded Dr. Um, Farmer and her team to do the preclinical studies to demonstrate that their approach can go into clinical trial. The remarkable thing about this story is she had just completed all the, all the steps to get to the IND, to the, get the permission from the FDA, kind of at the end of last year. And we didn't know CIRM was gonna be refunded. So when CIRM was refunded and we were able to, to fund her phase one, two clinical trial, it was just an amazing demonstration of what happens when you're able to support things. Um, so California is very special for that. So the approach that Dr. Big, Dr. Farmer uses is a combined um, step, is a matrix seeded with stem cells um, as a treatment for spina bifida. It's predicated on some early initial results with what's called the MOMS trial management of myelomeningeal cell study, which was an in, vitro, in utero surgical repair, where they showed that there was some early signs of efficacy. The idea behind this um, stem cell seed and matrix is that in addition to the surgical repair, it would induce regeneration and protect um, further neural damage and increase the probability of true, true functional um, outcome post-birth. Um, she shows really cute pictures of these English bulldogs who were actually born with spina bifida and were treated. So they're at Davis. So they're in a, they're in a very unique place where there's clinical um, opportunities for animals. And they showed um, proof of concept demonstration in these twin bulldogs. And then she went on to do experimental studies in sheep and demonstrated efficacy. And between everything that had to be done to characterize the product and do preclinical studies, the FDA gave her the go ahead for a trial and patients are now being enrolled. So more on that soon. How am I doing for time? Good, all right. And coming back to the transplant roots. Treatment for transplant. We all know pancreas transplant can be um, for type one diabetes, can can be impactful. We also know the difficulties of pancreas transplant. Know that we've had hope for islet cell transplant, but we also know that years and years later, even though we have proof of concept that it can work, it's still something that has not been able to achieve wide um, adoption or distribution or approval as a product. And again, because it is, the cell product itself is, can't be characterized, it's too heterogeneous. Often you need multiple donors, it's really, really tough to make something like that into a, a, a reliable therapy. So um, this company, Biocyte, was, was funded by CIRM to develop a technology of an embryonic stem cell-derived pancreatic progenitor cell, which is very well characterized um, in vitro and in animal studies to be insulin producing and responsive to glucose. But to take those cells and seed them on a matrix and 
put the, encapsulate them in a credit card size thin um, device that can then be implanted subcutaneously. This um, technology is being looked at in multiple configurations and without going into too much detail. The reason for these configurations is it's trying to tease out how to promote survival of these cells and so you need blood supply. So initially they tried just a totally impermeable membrane and it was really tough because there was limited blood supply and it, there was fibrosis. And so it was that whole balance of healing versus regeneration. So Tech Direct, I call it the holy device, which has specifically little holes in it that allow the, the um, formation of vessels, has demonstrated proof of concept that these implanted cells um, can proliferate and, be, and differentiate in the body. So these patients all had a zero insulin production and they recently demonstrated that several of these patients have C-peptide, which is a, a marker for insulin, de novo insulin production. And not only that, there was, there was actually responsiveness of the production according to the glucose level. So from in terms of mixed meal tolerance and, and a glucose challenge, it was a responsive. So it truly is a living medicine. Um, they also um, reported recently at the American Diabetes Association scientific session in, in uh, June that um, some patients experience a marked increase in the ability to stay within glucose range. And these are hypoglycemic unaware patients with um, better control of their hemoglobin A1C. So this is this in addition to the progress being made by Vertex, a company that's carrying on uh, Doug Melton's technology from Harvard um, are in the race. And we hope that whoever, you know, the, the fact is it's a win regardless of, of, of how this happens, right? All right, next. And it seems like a whirlwind, but, but um, I really do look forward to the discussion later. First sickle cell. So we've known about the molecular basis of, disease, of sickle cell disease since the 1940s when molecular biology then started to hold and we understood it, but there was nothing we could do about it specifically. We know that it results from a point mutation in the hemoglobin, um, beta hemoglobin gene and on chromosome 11, a single point mutation, a single typo results in this horrendous, horrendous um, disease which results in a shorter, in nearly a half, cutting the lifespan in half in, in those afflicted. But not only that, their quality of life is horrendous. Multiple ER visits with extreme pain. Um, and then these teenagers going into the ER and then you know stigmatized essentially just by virtue of having this disease and maybe even accused of it. So it's, it just has so much attached to it. It's horrendous. It's a horrendous thing. And this is, a New York Times depiction of it um, that really talks, that really kind of highlights what a horrible um, affliction this is for those um, with the disease. Um, one of the most remarkable things is we know, and I mentioned CRISPR-Cas9, Jennifer Dana, we know that we can deal with this. We know that we can correct this gene mutation now. And um, Francis Collins, who just recently stepped into NIH, invited us to um, the NIH to talk about CIRM, our funding model, how we were able to um, successfully take, take projects from, and translate them and get them into clinical trials, how we were able to successfully partner with industry. And during that meeting, um, the, Gary Gibbons, who was from Stanford, is the head of NHLBI, and his group approached me and said, we wanna partner with you to cure sickle cell. We want to use CIRM's funding model and you know, your peer review process and work on this together. So we actually inked a, a MOU and we funded three projects together and clinical stage programs. Um, one of them is Mark Walters program, which is a collaboration between IGI, Jennifer Dadna's group at Berkeley, UCSF and Don Cohn at UCLA. And one of them is actually from Boston Children's Hospital, uh, David Williams who um, 
was is really it, it, it is remarkable how the world becomes really really um, much tighter. And when he came and saw the opportunities to collaborate in California and the resources here it was like a dream. So those programs are all funded by CERM. The CRISPR program of Pat Matt Porteous just recently dosed. They just announced that they dosed a first patient through a spin out called Graphite Bio. Matt Porteous's work was funded by CERM to get to the IND. Um, the Walters trial is ongoing and the um, David Williams trial is also ongoing. The differences in the approach is that the Porteous Walters trials are correcting the defect and David Williams trial is um, modulating the, the expression of hemoglobin. So he's using um, short hairpin RNA to so silence BC11A which um, is involved in regulating the expression of fetal hemoglobin. See, it was found that fetal hemoglobin that we all express until we're born and we're no longer fetuses, they act, it's actually resistant even in those with sickle cell disease to sickling. So it phenotypically could be a correction. So that's David Williams' um, approach. I just wanted to demonstrate that we don't just back one single approach, right? If it makes sense and the science is there, we will back um, all the approaches that, that meet the, um, the criteria and the scientific rigor and have that impact. So cancer, CAR, I think it's an understatement to say that chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapies has it transformed the field along with second signal blockade, as well as CD47, which you heard from from Irv, right? So our immunotherapy for cancer has just exploded. CAR T therapy, for those who aren't familiar, is a form of gene therapy. It was the first gene therapy approved by the FDA. Well, you take T cells, as you know, their T cells are responsible for surveying and getting rid of tumors. And in the state of cancer, what happens is it's defective and you're not able to do that. So what essentially simplistically T cell, CAR T cell therapy is, is to engineer T cells to, to, to highly express very potent recognition of certain antigens that are expressed on these cancers so that these um, engineered T cells can seek and destroy the cancer very specifically. So the first CD19 CAR Ts that were approved demonstrated about an 80% response rate in patients who had zero response to chemotherapy, who had refractory and resistant um, um, cancers. Remarkable. Uh, Emily uh, Whitehead, who was the first patient treated in, at Penn, is now applying for colleges, right? So she was the very first patient as a child. Um, so it has transformed the field. CIRM has been funding this throughout in terms of next generation approaches. And I just list the different uh, CAR T cell programs we funded, including Dr. Mackles here at Stanford B for B cell. Uh, leukemia, multiple myeloma by Peseda, uh, partnered with Novartis. Um, Dr. Brown and Dr. Priceman from City of Hope are using IL-13 receptor alpha um, that are uh, truncated and combined with CD19 to treat malignant gliomas and in adults and children. And most recently, um, another program for pediatric transplant. I'm sorry, Dr. Priceman is with metastatic brain, uh, breast cancer to the brain, and Dr. Wang is with um, pediatric cancer. Uh, the other thing that's remarkable about the programs that CIRM have funded is that these programs all involve um, enrichment for what's called the uh, T uh, stem cell memory compartment in these products. So what happens is there are like these armies on reserve of memory T cells. Um, and so if there's some residual tumor or a minor recurrence, these, these, these uh, memory T cells become recruited, expand and go after the, the cancer. So it is something that prevents T cell exhaustion as well as um, increases the probability of durable um, response. I believe this is the final slide I have. I just wanted to talk about what's on the horizon. Um, I talked about the induced pluripotent stem cell and the remarkable um, potential for that. We have some embryonic stem cell derived treatments that are in clinical trials. 
but induced pluripotent stem cells have even more of a potential to be off the shelf just because skin is pretty, you know, accessible um, and uh, characterizable, expandable in banks. And combine that with specific gene therapies, you have a combination of, you know, multiple permutations in terms of precision medicine and approaches to a variety of indications. One of the programs here at Stanford led by Dr. Um, Tony Aro is with dystrophic epidermal lysis bullosa, the Colorado mutation, which is a mutation in collagen 7A1 um, that results in a basement membrane defect. Uh, what happens is the dermis and the epidermis aren't linked together. So they call this butterfly, we call these butterfly children because the skin is as fragile as a butterfly's wing. Um, the epidermis and dermis, instead of moving together upon friction, rub up against each other, create blisters, denude, and then result in something equivalent to a third degree burn. These patients have horrendous lives. They are constantly being dressed as burn victims, like similar to burn victims. Um, so it's a horrendous disease. And because they have the underlying mutation, other treatments, skin grafts, et cetera, are just fail. The approach that Dr. Aro and team are using is to harvest these patients' fibroblasts convert them to pluripotent stem cells, differentiate them, and, and then correct the defect in the collagen, differentiate them into keratinocytes, create epidermal sheets, and use those as the grafts. So CIRM is funding them through their, what's called IED enabling phase to de develop a GMP compatible production. They've demonstrated um, that they've been able to do this. So they've demonstrated feasibility. And now they're, not, they're now uh, completing the work for the IND submission to go into clinical trials. So that's, that's just kind of a little walk through a sample of the projects. Um, again, going back to the principles of uh, Oscar, um, training the workforce and leaders of tomorrow. CIRM has funded over the, the training of over 3,000 students high school, undergrad, graduate, postdoc. And here are just some pictures of some of them. Derek Rossi was a postdoc here at Stanford. He was one of the earliest recipients of, um, of a CERM Scholar Award. And he was a molecular biologist and got into the stem cell field because of a lot of things happening at the time in early days, went to Harvard Stem Cell Institute, um, continued what was initially a stem cell project. His mRNA project was actually um, started as a way to better a, a, a improvement on the Yamanaka protocol for inducing pluripotent stem cells, then saw the potential spun out Moderna and you know the rest is history, one of the first vaccines out there um, that's affected millions. And here's a picture of Sneha who came up to me after a meeting, just so excited because after her, after graduating, she landed a job immediately at Nova Nordisk because of her experience as a stem cell, um, as a CIRM intern. Uh, we promote diversity, equity, inclusion in all our programs. And what's amazing about this, um, our internships is that 50, over 50% 50 of uh, the students are first generation uh, college students. We reach students from the Cal States and community colleges and provide opportunities for them to bridge and work in labs at Stanford and at the UCs. And these, so that opens up their world and increases access and diversity to, to students around California. And these students have an opportunity to publish early on. I'm gonna end with this slide, which is I think, as I mentioned in 2014-ish, we had very few industry partnerships starting from 2015 all the way to now. You can see all of the different partnerships, including acquisitions, IPOs um, for CERM programs. You recognize some of them, Graphite Bio, 47 England to Gilead. So many of you recognize these as Stanford products. I'm going to end by saying that we are now in the midst of launching a new strategic plan. Um, as mentioned in, in the beginning, Prop 71, we were able to establish a track record and an identity, um, a brand, I would say a value proposition as an accelerating patient-centric funder partner and de-risker for basic translation on clinical research, builder of infrastructure and education programs. Taking that as a starting point, we're now crafting the strategy under Proposition 14 
which is a $5.5 billion funding. And we cannot just continue to do the same thing. We need to take it to the next era. And so in broad categories, our approach are going to be to continue to advance world-class science, but we propose to do so by building pathways to collaboration, such as shared competency hubs, uh, for real data sharing knowledge networks that build on what's already happening, but to, to make this more powerful to um, address um, areas such as CNS and neuropsychiatric disease, deliver world, uh, real world solutions by expanding the healthcare infrastructure, as well as creating public private partnerships to address challenges in, um, in manufacturing. By the way, that phase three, that near pivotal trial of Don Cones from UCLA that went to the company Orchard, it actually, I, we actually negotiated to bring it back to academia because it, for a variety of reasons, companies make decisions. You can have 100% success, but then there are corporate decisions. So CIRM is continuing to support it in academia. So it has another shot of actually going for it because it's basically everything is almost there to BLA to full approval. Um, so we do need to overcome the challenge and main, the challenges that Orchard had was actually tech transferring out the academic GMP process to commercial. So when they tried to bring it to Lanza and the Europe, it was really tough. So if CIRM is going to build public private partnership and capacity in California, um, and as well as provide opportunity for all, a major thing is developing a roadmap for access and affordability. One of the key features of Prop 14 is that you saw those industry partnerships. When royalties, when, when they start developing revenue, there's royalty due back to the state. And the, that royalty is now earmarked <clears throat> so that the legislature needs to put it toward um, accessibility and affordability programs, which are going to be directed by CIRM to make this accessible for all uh, uh, underserved communities or patients in need in California. Um, that's it. The new theme is life. There was a lot of promise. Science almost seems like science fiction, but the whole point is now it's truly building the systems to bring this to reality and to deliver it to all patients equitably across California and the world. That's all I have. I hope I didn't go over. Love to take questions.